Don't underestimate what's buried out there in the salt flats. These, these mining towns have a way of digging up really interesting old tech. No way. What is that? That is a fusion inverter cell. Incredibly rare and really dangerous. And you know the Guild of Engineers nicked all the ones we had in store at the museum just a few months ago. Pomeroy was furious. Well, they won't get their hands on this one. I'll make sure it's disposed of properly. Engineers, eh? They think they run the place. They don't know what they're playing with. Fire. Sorry? They're playing with fire. And that is a clip from Mortal Engines. I'm delighted to say I've been joined by its producer and co-writer, who is none other than Peter Jackson. How are you doing, Peter? I'm doing great, thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, Steve, for joining us. Um, this is uh, this is going to take some explanation. So tell us tell us about the film. Tell us just dip us slightly into the world of Mortal Engines. It's a, a movie that's based on a book written by Philip Reeve, who's is actually the first book in a series of four, and it's set uh, about three thousand years into the future, and it's a time when the uh, societies have adopted a rather different mode of operating than today, where the um, there is no more countries. There's no borders. What there is, though, is is, is there's city-states on wheels roaming around consuming each other. Standard procedure, really. Yes. So, so you have enormous what are called traction cities, and these things, you've got to imagine they're like the size of seven football fields all sort of in, end on end, like these huge, carrying thousands of people. And they're cities, and they have the big ones chase the small ones. They consume them by opening up the jaws and, and dragging them in. And they use them. They use the actual city that they capture for fuel to, to keep the engines going, and the people on the cities they capture are sort of absorbed into the societies. It's a sort of a pro-immigration film. Is that right? In a way. <laughs> well, that's, you could say that. I mean, sort of. There's one moment where, <laughs> where I think it's Hugo Weaving who says, I knew it would be a mistake coming into Europe. And I was thinking, oh, it's a Brexit film, actually. That's what it is. But you probably it could didn't be anything think. you, want, you yeah. want it to be. Yes, I know. I know. I, I mean, we did, that was a line that we did, a rather cheeky line that we put in there <laughs> uh, deliberately, I have to admit. It's not in Philip's book, although the whole the concept is, yeah. is in Philip's book. I read the book in 2001, 2002. I interviewed Philip, oh, right. uh, and instantly Philip, as, as of course generations have done, because it's such a wonderful concept, and Philip Reeve is a wonderful world builder in his mm. books. And uh, you get sort of like three or four chapters in and think, there's no way this could be filmed. You know, this is just, <laughs> it's, it's because this idea of predator cities. You see, uh, I was the opposite. I got three or four chapters in and thought, wow, it'd be a great film. <laughs> cool. well, I was going to ask you, because <laughs> yeah. at what stage did you hear about them? When you're going through these, is, is there something that instantly clicks and you go, this is gold. I don't really seek out films to make. I've got films that I, that I do want to make that people ask me to make, you know, another Tintin film, The Dam Busters. I've got plenty of films that people are waiting on and, um, and they're all films that I want to make one day. Um, so I'm not really look, looking for films. The books were were recommended to me. I never read them when they first, well, I guess when he published them. I read them in about 2008, by which case it was four books. And so I was able to binge on them, like a good Netflix show. I, I, was, I read the first one and then straight to the second, the third, the fourth. So I was on board with the idea of doing a film based on you know, the entire saga of Tom and Hester's life. And quite about the rights, thinking that they were probably, you know, had already taken. Because I realised that I was, you know, this was not when the books first came out. I was, I was coming on as a, a latecomer. But they were available and so, so, so we secured the rights back in 2008, I think it was. You mentioned Hester Shaw, who's the... Mm -hmm. uh, who's the the heroine in this, played mm. by, is it Hera Hillman? Hera, 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 Hera Hillman. Because a lot of it is basically her story. Just to explain a little bit about who she is and, and how we mm. follow her through this tale. Yes, she is really the person. She's a, sort of the catalyst for these stories. Hera Hillman, I mean, the character she plays, Hester Shaw, she's a very damaged character, which is what I, what I actually like too. She's not your normal Hollywood hero. As a young girl, her mother was brutally killed. She was um, injured and carries the scars of, of the attack. And she was basically an orphan because her father had long since died. She was alone in the wilderness just trying to escape from the man who killed her mother. And she's picked up by a, what you'd best describe as a homicidal half man, half robot called Shrike. <laughs> it's very dangerous. The last person on earth you'd ever want to encounter. But as it is, Shrike, who's been engineered from a corpse, a human corpse, um, 500 years earlier, um, this is a very complex story, isn't it? Shrike, who was engineered from a, from a corpse and his memory wiped, 
is starting to get, he's the last stalkers to survive because there used to be armies of these things and there's no longer, they've all gone, but there's this one survivor. And he's starting to get flashes of his memory of a human life that he once had. And he was a father of a, of a young girl as a human being. And so he sees this, this um, he sees this young Hester Shaw who's just escaped from the um, person that murdered her mother, seen her mother killed. And he takes her on. He is a sort of a sort of a, a parental instinct kicks in, and Hester is basically raised for the next uh, ten years by this very unusual character called Shrike. She comes out of that being a rather you know having had a very um, challenging upbringing, yes. one could say. And, and what she's obsessed with as a character is she wants to hunt down the man who killed her mother, and that's where her paths intersect with. The London attraction city, because this character is on the city, and but of course things don't go according to plan, as they never do. Of course, do. when you were setting up the, I don't know if you have rules and guidelines for how this film is going to feel and how it's going to look, uh, just in terms of describing it, mm. is it? It's n- it kind of is steampunk, but it isn't, and it is analog. I don't know yes. what, yeah, no, 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 sure. what, were the, what were the guidelines that you. Well, we didn't we didn't really want to go steampunk particularly because to me steampunk's a particular it's like a Jules Verne genre. Steampunk is like the science fiction as per the Victorian times, you know, and I think it's cool. But we wanted to make the film as realistic as we could, so we didn't want to have it stylized in the way that it would be stylized if it was if we went sort of down the steampunk road. And Philip Reeves' books do somewhat go down the steampunk road, because what I think what's important is when you're dealing with something that's this, this fantastical. And you're asking people to believe that there can be a a thousand foot long city on wheels chasing another one. You want to somehow in the middle of all that try to try to make it as realistic as you possibly can, which is sort of crazy because it's the most unrealistic thing in the world. So you you just start to do every trick in the book to make it feel real. And we have a a team of designers and who do a fantastic job at coming up with ideas of how these things would look. And it certainly is an analog. I mean, the film doesn't take place in a world where they can make silicon chips anymore. That technology is long since gone and forgotten and they wouldn't have a clue how to make a silicon chip. It's back to the analog world again, but much more advanced because we abandoned analog, what, 1980s or the 1990s, and this is a, an imagining of what it would be like if the analog tech had carried on and, and uh, you know and developed to its natural conclusion, rather than being cruelly cut short in the way we did. Which is why old tech is so prized in this film. Yes, part of the story, obviously, is that, is that the reason why the society is so different in 3,000 years' time is that there was a huge um, cataclysmic war that takes place very soon in our future. So it's long in the past, and in, in terms of the movie but it's called the 60, the 60 minute war and it's when countries start to fire these weapons at each other and so what the 60 minute war is based on is this um, technology that's not nuclear the 60 minute war probably takes place in about 100 years from now and so they, and so they've developed even worse weapons than nuclear weapons they've developed quantum energy weapons which are very destructive and Sure enough, the world is basically destroyed and most of the people on it. And so this society has risen from the ashes of that. But there is old tech, what they call old tech, um, that they're forever digging up. And some of it is for museum purposes. They find old cell phones and they don't know what, really what they are. They find normal, mundane things of our world. And because they don't have records anymore, they don't really have the actual the knowledge of what our world was. They're trying to figure it out from the bits and pieces that they dig out of the ground. But amongst the things that they dig up are fragments of the quantum energy weapons. And most people don't know what they are and they're all in bits and pieces, but there is... Um, certainly one or two characters in the story who decide that they could possibly put one of these weapons back together again if they get enough bits and pieces. When you got excited by the four books, did you all... I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that you produced it and and co-wrote it. Was that always what you wanted to do? Were you going to direct it at any stage? Was it quite nice not directing it? Uh, Well, yes, yes, to answer all those questions, yes, yes and yes. (laughs) When I got the the rights to the books, we were just in the middle of, or towards the end of finishing off um, District 9 and Tintin, two movies that, that, I, that I was producing, other directors. But it was a very, very busy time, so we got the rights, and Mortal Engines was going to be the film that I'd move on to after we were done with those other two projects. And we did a little bit of work on it. We That moment arrived, and we decided to do some design. Previs hadn't quite started working on the script, and then The Hobbit came along, which was unexpected, really, because the, the rights were a bit tied up, And but um, Warner's managed to clear the rights. And as soon as they did, the sort of the pressure was on to, for us to do The Hobbit. So we, we had to put that uh, the Mortal Engines project, which I was looking forward to, to doing, that had to go on a shelf for six years. And during the course of the six years making the three Hobbit movies, um, Christian Rivers, who is a person that's worked with us for 25 years, 
um, as a storyboard artist and then a pre biz artist. And he's done visual effects, he did animation, won an Academy Award on King Kong. And, um, you know, he's really been part of our team. And over the course of the 25 years, has been doing, you know, more and more tricky and important work for us. And I know that he's always wanted to direct. And so during The Hobbit, I had him come on board as a second unit director. And he did some very really tricky scenes. Uh, the second Hobbit movie has the dwarves escaping in barrels down the river, which is quite a long sequence. And that's pretty much. Christian sequence. So I was watching him shoot this stuff, you know, and obviously getting the results of what he was shooting, and I thought it was fantastic stuff. I liked the way that he was working on set, and I knew that he wanted to make a, a feature film next uh, after The Hobbit. And I just really didn't want him to go off and do the feature film with some, some with some, somebody else, because I thought that he's part of our team. He's worked for so long, and that somehow I should be part of the film he made. I, want, I wanted to help him, and I knew that he would make a great film. So um, it, it all came together. The Hobbit was finished. We were bringing our attention back to this particular project again, and Christian was there ready to direct his first film. Just in our last couple of minutes, Peter, I just wanted to, to mention They Should Not Grow Old, which comes out on DVD. We have been inundated with, uh, as I'm sure you've had many thousands mm. of letters from people who've been so touched by, mm. uh, by that. Mm. And I just wanted to mention just one here, yep. which is typical uh, of many. Isabel Hansen, and she wanted this to go to you. My great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, and my two great-great-uncles were killed in the First World War. Oh. An Armistice Day always fills me with sadness when I think of their deaths. After watching Peter Jackson's film, I was genuinely surprised to feel uplifted. There were scenes of horror and tragedy, but there was also insight into life away from the front line and the amazing camaraderie between the men. The narrative provided by the veterans made me realize that the soldiers were completely lacking in self-pity and were motivated by their belief in doing the right thing. Heartfelt thanks to Peter Jackson for making this astonishing wow. film. That's great. It's, um, I mean, one thing that I always think of... <sighs> I mean, it's, I mean, it's a lovely thing to hear, but the film is very much the story of the men who survived. And I do always just pause every now and again and think, well, if, the, if we had interviews, obviously, which we don't, from the million or so uh, British Empire men that were killed, they would probably tell us a slightly different story. You know what I mean? So I think it is important. Look, I'm really, I'm really happy to hear because there is a humanity amongst these people, whether they lived or died. There is a, there is a camaraderie, and that's what I really wanted to tell the, tell the human story. I, I'm not a, a historian. I don't pretend to be. So I didn't want to, to sort of mimic what an historian would do. There's lots of documentaries that have involved um, historians, lots of books. I was just wanted to tell a story from a normal average person based on the humanity of these of these people. And that's why we took out all the references to dates and places. And it's a very small world. And this, this war affected so many people because you can go to a very small area in the Somme uh, near Beaumont Hamel and within about half a mile in this particular area, you have the place where my grandfather was uh, went over the top and was machine gunned, and, and and he did ultimately survive. But he was hit on the on July the first. Um, Christian Rivers, the director of our film, has a great uncle in the Gordon Highlanders who was killed in, in November, and his grave is there. And my partner Fran Walsh, who co-wrote our movie, her great uncle um, was killed in May 1918, and he's buried. Very close by. So you, well, can so, I just say my so, my great uncle was killed in 1917 there as well. Yeah, so. yeah. So it is. I mean, it's 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 a just has profoundly affected these. You know, all of our all of the empire countries are the effect of the first world war. Certainly in New Zealand, is far more powerful than the second war for some, for some reason. It's like it's it changed the country in a way that the second world war didn't. Peter Jackson, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.